could we just ask that all of our pastors would, would come and occupy this space here on the second and the third row? All pastors that are sitting in the rear, would you please make your way to the front, please? The second and the third rows. All our state presidents, our moderators, any state presidents and moderators, Pastor, please make your way. And if you run out of space, we got some more on this side. This is going to be reserved for the family of the pastor or the president, all the way on the other end. All the way on the other end. Okay, brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you here for our president's annual address, and uh, we would like for you to receive the president's cabinet. At this time, we're going to introduce, have walking in our first vice president, I mean our vice president at large from Florida, Dr. Bartholomew Banks. Our first vice president from Texas, Reverend William Timothy Glenn and Sister Glenn. Our second vice president, Reverend Frank S. Garden of Tennessee and Sister Garden. Our third vice president, Reverend Napoleon Smith of New Mexico. Our fourth vice president from Alabama, Reverend Dr. Robert Alexander and Sister Alexander. Our general secretary, Reverend S.C. Dixon of Louisiana. Our program to introduce uh, the pastor's past, the president's pastor, the Reverend Dr. Kyron Coleman of, L of Louisiana. Our parliamentarian, the Reverend Darwin T. Lazard of Louisiana. Our 
my statistician, the Reverend Dr. J. M uh, Roy Morrison of Florida. Our treasurer, Reverend Dr. F.D. Sampson and Sister Sampson of Texas. Cabinet to be seated at this time. The leaders of our auxiliaries are now coming Dr. Barbara Wright of Florida, our senior woman's president. Ministers, Wives, and Widows President, Sister Eartha Cross. Our Preachers Conference, Reverend Johnson of Texas and Sister Johnson. President of our WIA, Sister Deidre Anderson of Texas. President of our Brotherhood, Brother Forrestal Lawton of Kansas City. Sister Marnette Walker of Texas, President of our Ushers Auxiliary. Sister Shemaya Clemens, president of our junior women of Texas. Dr. Joel Taylor, the director of our Congress, and Dr. Taylor. Of Illinois. Dr. Dr. Terrence Grant Malone of Texas, director of our Youth and Children's Convention. Dr. A.W.A. Mays of Texas, the Dean of our Congress. Reverend Dennis Jones of our foreign mission, voice of our foreign mission of Texas, and Sister Jones. The Reverend Timothy Woods of our evangelism, and Sister Woods of Alabama. Delbert Brown of Tennessee and Sister Brown of Tennessee, college and seminary. Reverend Monroe Tucker, uh, uh, Education Board of Alabama and Sister Tucker. Jerry William Daly and Sister Daly from, 
Texas over chaplaincy. Dr. Delbert Mack of Texas over our, over our church growth. We're going to need a seat somewhere up here. I won't say what Reverend Glenn said, but I'm just going to say if you just kind of get a little closer, Reverend, Reverend, Reverend Dennis. Matter of fact, I believe you better put Reverend. Come on up here, Reverend Malone. Dean Mays. Reverend Dennis Jones, come on, get over here. That'll give y'all a little bit more room over there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, Brother Delbert Mack, you can come on and take your rightful place. Here. At this time, would you all receive the eminent and illustrious president of the Florida State Convention, Baptist State Convention, and the vice president of large of the National Baptist Convention of America, International Incorporated, Dr. Banks. What a joy it is that God has blessed us once again to assemble here in the great city of Oklahoma City to share with our president, the greatest president of any denominational organization anywhere. And I think we need to give God a great big hand clap of praise for, for all the opportunity we have. To all of our vice presidents, ministry leaders, chairman and boards, and to each of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we've come tonight to express our love in a tangible way uh, to let our president and his family know just how much we are appreciative of the work that he's doing on our behalf. If you were here this morning, you ought to be still excited about what is happening in NBCA. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the good things God has in store for us. That's just the beginning, as he, in his own words, says that's the initiation. And so we know that God has great things in store for us. So at this time, we're going to ask that we prepare to receive our devotion uh, that will be brought to us by the Reverend Ricky T. Farrell, Jr., pastor of the Greater New Bethel Baptist Church of Inglewood, California. Let's receive him with a great amen. Good evening. To our president, to all of our pastors and vice presidents, cabinets, to you, our body of convention, it's good to be here. Really quickly, in Psalm 116, verse number 12, it reads as thus, What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? You may be seated. There is one particular time in every year that we are receive information uh, during this time of the year, which we call tax time. Tax time is to tell us the debt that we owe. We owe it to Uncle Sam to get his money back based on what we have received. And the truth of the matter is, we don't really owe Uncle Sam like we owe the Lord. Psalmist raised the question, what shall I give back to God for all that God has given me? And the truth of the matter is, all of us have something to give back to God. I mean, the simple fact that he woke you up this morning, started you on your way, he answers our prayer. That's why the psalmist in the beginning says, I love the Lord because he's heard my cry. But not only does he hear us, but he inclines his ear unto us. 
which suggests that he stretches out just to hear what we have to say. And all of the benefits for all that God has done for us. The question is, how do you respond to what you've been receiving? The first thing he says, I'm making a promise to serve the Lord. He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. It is, it is, it is a cup of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for God doing only what God can do. And could that be us tonight? That we sit here not just so quiet, silent, and shut up. But all of us should thank God for all the things that he's done for us. I mean, every one of us got something to thank him for. Maybe he's healed your body. Maybe he's picked you up. Maybe he saved your soul. I'm waiting for somebody to talk back to me. Maybe he's answered your prayer. Maybe he gives you strength when you're weak. Maybe he's been your, your joy in times of sorrow. And the idea is that we ought to be able to give God thanks no matter the trouble, no matter the trials, no matter the tears, because we all got something to thank the Lord for. Even Andre Crouch says, I thank God for my mountains. I thank God for my valleys. I thank God for all the things and the trials he's brought me through. Because if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he can solve me. I wouldn't know what faith in God can do. So through it all, I learned how to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I learned how to take him at his word. But watch this. Not only, not only does he make a promise to serve the Lord, but he makes a promise to give him a sacrifice. Wait, wait, wait a minute, because the problem is God is not interested in what you can spare to him. I wish y'all hear me. The, the fact that he's done so much for you in, in, in that he gave his son the ultimate sacrifice. He gave the best that he had, all that he had. And for you to be stuck in stingy, that just ain't right. And the question is, what are you willing to give up to him based on what he's given you. He says, I'm willing to serve the Lord. After he supplied me with all that I have, I got to give it back in response in service to him. In other words, that there's nobody in the body of Christ that should be sitting by themselves or being a bench member. Everybody should be doing something for him. Come on, don't talk to me like that. Everybody should be doing something for him. Lastly, and I'm done, I owe the Lord. I owe him so much that I'm going to serve him. He makes a promise to serve him. He makes a promise to sacrifice. But lastly, here it is, he makes a promise to shout. He says in verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Watch this. Here God is. Prayer is private, but God's provision is public. Because the truth of the matter is there's some things that only you and God have talked about, but he's blessed you in public. And if you pray privately and he's answered your prayer, you ought to praise him publicly. And, and what the psalmist says is, is this. The same voice you've been asking God for, you ought to be using the same voice to acknowledge him with. The, the same God, the same voice you've been begging the Lord with, you ought to bless the Lord with. The, the same voice you've been praying to the Lord with, you ought to praise the Lord with. Matter of fact, here's the song, the songwriter says, how can I say thanks for all the things that he's done for me? Things so undeserving, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God, be the glory. To God, be the glory. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, somebody ought to testify, he's raised me. To God be the glory. Anybody got to thank you tonight? Anybody owe the Lord tonight? 
Come on, if he's blessed you, you ought to give him some praise. If, if he's done anything for you, you ought to make a payment today. If he's healed your body, you ought to make a payment today. If he's answered your prayer, you ought to make a payment today. If he's got you from where you live, you ought to make a payment today. If he's kept you all week long, you ought to make a payment today. If he's given you a reasonable proportion of help and strength, you ought to make a payment today. If he's looked behind your faults and met every one of your needs, you ought to make a payment tonight. If he's been good to you and anybody else know it, you ought to make a payment tonight. The reason why I make a payment tonight, because amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see through many dangers. Toes and snares I have already come with his grace. Amen. Let's say amen for the preacher. The future of the NBCA is bright because God has blessed us with a tremendous wealth of young preachers that are coming along that can continue this great legacy. My brothers and sisters, it is my delightful pleasure now to ask that you would join me in welcoming the great president of the National Baptist Convention of America. God has tremendously blessed us and we want to express our gratitude to God by welcoming Dr. Samuel C. Talbot and Lady Matilda Talbot and their family. Would you please stand and show some excitement for our president? Come on, we can do better than that. Amen, amen. Yes. Let's celebrate, let's celebrate, let's celebrate, let's celebrate. Amen, amen. Amen. One more time as he makes it to his seat. Praise God, praise God. going to ask now that uh, we uh, proceed with our tributes to our president and first lady. Oh, I'm sorry, selections. You're right. Thank you. Selection from the General Baptist Convention of Oklahoma Concert Choir. Let's receive them with a great amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. We thank God for this day. We thank God to be able to sing praises unto him today. Hallelujah. Bless your name, oh God. We want to encourage you today to walk in your victory. We want to encourage you to walk in the victory that Jesus has given us, that we can be free. We can be free indeed. Hallelujah. the almighty i've been set free he'll delivered make complete now i'm walking in victory and by the hand of the almighty i've been set free he'll delivered make complete now i'm walking in victory by the hand by the hand of the almighty i've been set free he'll delivered make complete Almighty, I've been set free. 
This time we're going to move into the area of tributes for our program, and we're going to ask now that uh, Sister Eartha Cross would come, president of our ministers' wives and widows, Hammond, Louisiana. She's going to provide a tribute on behalf of our first lady, Sister Matilda Tollett. To our illustrious president and his cabinet, to our presider, and to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, good evening. Good evening. Dr. Dumas, I'm going to ask if you will escort Sister Matilda up here, please. Many of you have not had a chance to at least see her, so as she's coming up, feel free to applaud and wave because you get to see our Sister Matilda.
song says, isn't she lovely? A shero is defined as a woman admired or a woman who's in, idealized for her courage, her outstanding achievements, or her noble qualities. One who possesses strong character and abilities. One who supports, encourages, and pushes others to be better and to do better. NBCA International does not have to search for a shero. We don't have to search newspapers, magazines, or history books. We don't have to tune into CNN or MSNBC. We don't have to search Facebook or Twitter. NBCA International is blessed to have our own shero. Our shero is Sister Matilda Talbert. She epitomizes that definition with her courage and noble qualities. She supports, encourages, and pushes all of us to do better. This includes President Talbert, her daughters, her students, and each and every one of us. Her sweet spirit is one of her strengths. Her meekness should not be mistaken for weakness because she can also be a quiet storm. She is comfortable in her own skin and is happy with who she is. Sister Talbot has been blessed to sit in the presence of the privileged and the accomplished, but she also feels blessed to sit among God's ordinary and everyday people. Psalms 139, 14a says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Sister Talbot is fearfully and wonderfully made by God, and it is evident in the way she lives a life that is pleasing to God. She is dedicated to God. She is dependent on God. She is delighted in God. She is directed by God. And she is dynamic for God. Sister Talbert, we honor you tonight. This convention honors you because of who you are. The NBCA Ministers Wives and Widows Auxiliary members honor you because of who you are to us. We love who you are. We appreciate who you are, and we are grateful for who you are. We thank you for your relationship, your fellowship, your membership, your leadership, your friendship, your companionship, and your kinship. We honor you with a standing ovation and words of encouragement from your auxiliary members from across the United States. We give you honor from Texas and California. We give you honor from Mississippi and Alabama. We give you honor from Florida and Tennessee. We give you honor from South Carolina, Illinois, and Indiana. We give you honor from Kansas, Missouri. We give you honor from Oklahoma. And you know we give you honor from the state of Louisiana. Sister Talbot, we love you, we honor you, and we pray God's continued blessings upon you. In addition to these words of encouragement, we present this token of love to you, and the token is being filled in a beautiful box. I leave these words with you from these sisters who are standing. Thank you for being our friend travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true, you're a pal and a confidant. And if you threw a party, invited everyone you knew, you would see the biggest gift would be from us and the card attached would say, thank you for being our friend. You are our shero. At this time, will every member of NBCA please stand? Every member Please stand. Sister Shauna, I need those, and Sister Barbara. Sister Talbert, 
We honor you with love. We honor you with a standing ovation. We honor you with sweet roses. All because you are sweet, you are sensational, and you are our shero. We love you and God bless you. Sister Shauna, we need you to help her go back down. <laughs> time for our first lady. It's a tremendous sacrifice to share your husband and father with us, and we want to say thank you. We're going to ask now that our praise team would, would come and prepare to give a selection, and while they're coming, we're going to ask that uh, Dr. Barbara Wright, president of Senior Women's Ministry Union of the Mount Zion Church of Tampa, will prepare for a tribute to our president along with the Greater St. Mary Missionary Baptist Church. So let's receive the NBCA's praise team at this time.
Presiding President Banks, honored and esteemed President Tolbert, Lady Tolbert, my brothers and my sisters in the Lord. A dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan backed by action makes your dream come true. Keep striving for your dreams. Years ago, a farmer owned land along the Atlantic sea coast. He constantly advertised for hired hands. Most people were reluctant to work on farms along the Atlantic. They dreaded the awful storms that raged across the Atlantic, wreaking havoc on the buildings and crops. As the farmer interviewed applicants for the job, he received a steady stream of refusals. Finally, a short, thin man, well past middle age, approached the farm. Are you a good farm hand, the farmer asked him. Well, I can sleep when the winds blow, answered the little man. Although puzzled by his answer, the farmer desperate for help hired him. The little man worked well around the farm, busy from a dawn to dusk. And the farmer felt satisfied with the man's work. Then one night, the winds howled loudly in from offshore. Jumping out of bed, the farmer grabbed a lantern and rushed next door to the hired hand's sleeping quarters. He shook the little man and yelled, get up, a storm is coming. Tie down, tie things down before they blow away. The little man rolled over in bed and said firmly, no, sir, I told you I can sleep when the winds blow. Enraged by the response, 
the farmer was tempted to fire him on the spot. Instead, he hurried outside to prepare for the storm. To his amazement, he discovered that all the haystacks had been covered with tarps. The cows were in the barns, the chickens were in the coops, and the doors were barred. The shutters were tightly secured. Everything was tied down. Nothing could blow away. The farmers then understood what his hired hand meant. So he returned to his bed to also sleep while the winds blew. It has been said, a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan. A plan backed up by action makes your dreams come true. Tonight, I stand to say that we celebrate a president, a man of vision who has led us thus far and truly can sleep during the storm because he has proven himself to be a, a leader who's prepared. There are two words that's synonymous with our president. Those two words are vision and victory. Habakkuk 2, 3 and 4 states, And the Lord said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Yes, vision and victory, Mr. President. We salute you tonight because of your vision and the victory. Because in your five years of service, you have turned your back on mediocrity, so prevalent amongst us, and have strived for excellence in every endeavor. You have partnered with numerous groups and all has been rewarding to this convention. Today we heard a utopian announcement. It is said that there are no great men apart from the vision received by that man and his willingness to pursue and make concrete that which begins as an abstraction. A painter envisions the finished work before he sets his brush to the canvas. A builder sees a complete product long before he, do he draws a model or lays a brick. Mr. President, we salute you because you see the ways of God for us before you deliver the message or recommend of the project. Such a visionary leader has been and is Dr. Samuel C. Talbert, Jr. The victory that is the end results of the vision is never a singular experience. The dreamers, the visionaries victory is a shared victory. Those of us he serves are joint beneficiaries of President Talbert's victory. Shakespeare has written, and I quote, a victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. Mr. President, you've turned your back on mediocrity and you have pressed toward excellence in your God-blessed way of bringing home full numbers, such as been seen in your five years of service to this convention. We are profoundly honored to pay tribute to you tonight for all you have given to this, our National Baptist Convention of America International Incorporated, to God be the glory for all he has done through and with you. God bless you. Good evening. I bring you greetings from the Greater St. Mary Missionary Baptist Church, Lake Charles, Louisiana, 
where President Pastor Samuel C. Talbert Jr. is our pastor. My name is Kevin Peart. I'm one of the servants at that church. We thank you for this opportunity for giving us a small opportunity to express our tribute and our admiration toward our pastor. What you get to see on a national level, we've seen all of our lives. Uh, at this time, no, we do have some members from Greater St. Mary that did make the trip, so at this time, would you please stand? The members from Greater St. Mary? Amen. You may be seated at this time. Pastor Talbert, as always, we can't pay you for what you're worth, but we're going to try. <laughs> at this time, for... Our members who could not make the trip, we wanted to do something special. So at this time, we do have a tribute, a uh, video tribute that we uh, will present to President Talbert. But, and then I'll take my seat. But once again, Pastor Talbert, we want you to know from the Greater St. Mary Missionary Baptist Church, first and foremost, we love you. We praise God for what you're doing, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. And remember, Greater St. Mary, we ain't going nowhere. We love you. Congratulations, Pastor Talbert. I pray God's richest blessings upon you and your family. Congratulations, Pastor. I'm proud of you. One more for Christ. Congratulations, Pastor. We love you. Congratulations, Pastor. I love you. Congratulations to my pastor, a great leader, a great man of God, my mentor, my teacher, the person I want to be most like. Congratulations for another great year as the National Baptist Convention President from the Gladys. Good morning, Pastor Talbot. It's Brother Marks. I'm standing here in the Sunday school class. We just got through with men's Sunday school. And we're thinking about you and praying about you. We want to send blessings and, and mercies to you on President's Night. We know that if any pastor in the world deserves it, you do. So we send our blessings and our congratulations to you. Amen. Well-deserved tributes. Thank you so very much. We have among us tonight a living legend who is a great friend of our president. He's a pastor emeritus of the Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church of Shreveport, a past vice president at large of the National Baptist Convention USA, and the person of Reverend Dr. Harry Blake. He's going to come now and share greetings to our president. Let's receive him with a great amen as he comes.
I have no wife, no church. <laughs> and in our annual session last week, I resigned from being president at large of our convention. Um, Pastor, thank you for, Mr. President, to the officers and members of this convention, to my homies, uh, Brother Jeffrey Yon. Uh, I almost called him Pennywell. <laughs> he was saying to me earlier, he didn't know how he got it. I told him he's the right color. Dixon and the official staff, I wanted to be with my friends, and he has not just begun to be my friend. He was my friend before he ascended to this position. And uh, many of us like to identify with you when you're on the mountain, but we've been in the valley together. Dr. Talbot reminds me of John the Baptist. It is said he was a man sent from God. And you can't be sent from what you have been. And John, like this pastor, like, like John, knew who he was. They uh, asked him if he was Elijah, one of the great ones. He said, no, I'm a voice. And you know, if a person knows who he is, he doesn't allow anybody to define him. And one thing about a voice, a voice is not to be seen, but to be heard. Pastor, I want to thank you for the leadership you're giving, and, and I won't uh, take up any time because old folk don't know when to sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I brought a gift uh, of $500, but my check doesn't come till the fourth me to mention to you, I've written my memoirs, Plantations, Protests, and Pulpit, Lessons I've Learned from Phases of My Life. I was born, reared, lived on a place, plantation until I was 24 years old, and then I joined, Dr. King invited me to join his staff, and then after serving him, I became a pastor, so I have put my life in those three phases. Uh, the book is on the outside. Don't ask me what it costs. Uh, it's a good read. We're tremendously blessed to still have our pioneers with us. Let's praise God for Dr. Harry Blake. Sister Scobie has an expression of love for our president's family. Would you would you come at this time? We would be remiss here in Oklahoma City if we forgot to do this. In honor of Sister First Lady Matilda Tolbert, we miss the beautiful daughters of President Tolbert. So I would like to represent both Kaylee and Candace with a dozen of roses and a monetary gift from Oklahoma City.
It's just nice to be nice. Let's praise God for Oklahoma City and their hospitality. Amen. Thank you so very much. We've come now for that time on our program where we can show our love in a tangible way to our president. We're going to ask now the Reverend William Timothy Glenn, first vice president of National Baptist Convention of America International, and the pastor of the Mount Olive Baptist Church, Fort Worth, Texas, to come and lead us in giving. Let's receive him with a great amen. I presided at Dr. Banks, President Talbert, to all who share tonight. The president says, those roses on the table, brothers, make y'all look like y'all in a coffin. <laughs> the president said that. I didn't say that. So don't go to sleep. There are a couple of undertakers in here tonight. A amen. Brothers and sisters, we've gathered here this evening to hear from our president, but also to share our expressions of love to him for the outstanding leadership he gives to the National Baptist Convention of America. Amen. What we witnessed this morning through the leadership of this president is unprecedented. We've never seen it on the order we saw it today. You ought to put your hands together and praise God. Someone to walk in and, and, and give a million dollars. Amen. Uh, to help undergird the vision of our, our leader. And we, we praise and we thank God for our president. Um, those members cabinet and officers, amen, you, you received correspondence and what we've asked you to do, and we hope and trust you'll do your very best, but never allow what you can't do to keep you from doing what you can do, amen, and if you fall a little short, you can see Dr. Joel Taylor and Dr. Dennis Jones. They've got plenty of money. And uh, they'll, they'll loan it to you. Uh, uh, Pastor Dennis Jones' interest rate is a little bit higher than Dr. Joel Taylor's. Amen. I already know that. Uh, but I, I want to I wanna thank you. Amen. If you've got your gifts and uh, you want it, your, your, your name's called as long as it's legible. Amen. Amen. I can I can I can read it. Uh, I want to begin with six hundred dollars, and then six hundred dollars from Dr. F. D. Sampson, six hundred dollars from Dr. Bartholomew Banks, uh, six hundred dollars from Dr. J. Roy Morrison, uh, six hundred dollars from T. Grant, Dr. T. Grant Malone. If you give him six hundred dollars, you is a doctor, because are not strong enough. Amen. Foreign Mission Board, six hundred dollars. Uh, Dr. Janice Carl Jones, $600. Dr. S.C. Dixon, uh, $1,200. You know he had to... This is his pastor. Amen. And if you need some money, he just may give it to you, you know. Dr. Terry White, $600. Dr. Coleman, $400. Dr. Lazard, $600. Dr. D.L. Grant, $600. $600 from Dr. Joel Taylor, $400 from Dr. Maurice Davis. Where are you? Brothers, if y'all will come with the vessels, amen. NBCA Brotherhood, $600. WIA, $600. The Usher, $600. Dr. Lady Johnson, $600. Junior Women, $200. Dr. 
Dr. Jerry William Daly, $600. Dr. Monroe Tucker, $600. Dr. Napoleon Dave, uh, uh, Smith, $600. Dr. Frank Gordon, $600. Dr. A.W.A. Mays, $600. Dr. Delbert Mack, $600. Dr. Mitchell Adger, $600. Pastor Anthony Scott, $500. Dr. Timothy Woods, $600. The Evangelical Board, $600. Dr. Robert Alexander, $600. The College and Seminary Board, $600. Dr. Scobie, $400. Dr. Delbert Brown, $400. Dr. Michael Pryor, $600. Minister's wife, $600. Dr. Craig Pullum, $500. Dr. Showers, $400. Senior women, $600. Ushers, do you have the envelopes? If you're in need of an envelope to place your gift in, raise your hand now, and one of our ushers will see you receiving one. Dr. Cavett, $500, Oklahoma, President of Oklahoma State Convention. Dr. Curtis Wallace, $600. Dr. Willie Love, $200. Dr. Reverend Gregory Moss, Dr. Elmo Garner, $400. Adrick Lane, $400. Pastor Ross Johnson, $400. Brother Johnny Anderson, $300. Pastor Quentin McKinney, $500. Reverend Willie Giles, $300. Uh, Dr. Brandon Dumas, $500. Dr. F.N. Williams, $400. Reverend Alvin Noel, $200. Pastor and Sister George Brooks, $450. Barry Hill at? Pastor D.R. Barry Hill, $401.01. Axel <laughs> Wilson, $300. Sister Hattie Wade, $300. Reverend Roy Olton Brackens, $300. General Con Baptist Convention of Oklahoma, $1,000. Reverend Timothy Caesar, $200. Reverend Lannis Joseph, $200. Is there any cent money? In Louisiana, where I come from, there, there would always be some cent money. Amen. But they just didn't send it. They made sure they had somebody checking to make sure it got there. Amen. Our ushers are going to come and give us directions as they lead us around as we bring our gifts. Amen. President Gary Tyson, General Baptist Convention Northwest, $300. Will you stand on both sides and follow the direction of our ushers? Dr. Lord B. Hall, who got out of the hospital today, $600. Amen. Protective service, $245. Amen. Pastor Demetrius Kleist, 
Pastor Th Snurley Simpson, $300. If y'all can give us some walking music, amen. No, no, that's just a goodie, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Dr. Joseph Bethea, $200. Well, three hundred dollars. Reverend Delvin Atchison, $500. Pastor Brian Wilson, $200. Health Awareness Team, $800. Ricky Farrell, $200, amen.
That's Leroy Taylor, $400. Thank God for our convention ushers. Y'all look like y'all all marched out tonight. Y'all not marching. Everyone had an opportunity to give. We got some money coming. That's the showers if you'd like to go. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your expressions of love to our president. Thank you so very much. At this time, we're going to have a present, presentation of our president, Reverend Dr. Karen Coleman, pastor of the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church of Lake Charles, Louisiana and the president's pastor. And then we'll have a solo by Dr. Cynthia W. Taylor, St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church of Chicago, Illinois. Mr. Presider, President Talbot, and members of this convention, as an educational leader, it would be easy to describe our president and compare him leadership styles according to Webster, Maxwell, and other notable philosophers. But as a good Baptist and a certified believer, when you put Webster aside and Maxwell down, you will clearly understand that our president guides according to Matthew 23, 11. To be great, you must be humble and you must serve. And so when you see our president, whether you know him or not, just met him or are reminded of him, it is clear he is not in his position by accident because he exemplifies and patterns his leadership style, not only according to the Bible, but some of the biblical patriarchs. He, like Moses, comes from humble beginnings, single mother, raised in the housing projects of Lake Charles, Louisiana. But unlike his circumstances, like Caleb, he had the determination and the courage to spearhead a drive to liquidate the debts of this convention and move the headquarters from Dallas at a profit to our convention and strategically place it on Simmons University, where it became not only a headquarter building, but it is now a resource center for the national convention across America and the world. Like Joseph, he sees the dream that God has raised him from some pitfall situations. And he understands that coming out was not just about his glory, but God strategically placed him on top soil to serve others. God gave him, like Boaz, his Ruth in a person of Matilda who not only demonstrated, but she said to like Ruth, where thou goest, I will go, and your God will be my God. Like Mordecai, President, you have faced your enemies and your naysayers for a, such a time as this. 
You dream, develop, plan, and have marketed skills that have assisted us in the areas of social justice, natural disasters, strategic planning, economic development, when no other convention even thought about it. You too, like Ezekiel, spoke to these dry bones and breathed new life into this convention. You started us with partnerships in the form of alphabets, HBCUs, SCUs, D-Free, and MMBB. But like Nehemiah, you are a builder. You've led Greater St. Mary through three different campuses and turn around and make one church at three different locations because you serve with knowledge. And this convention no longer just visits, but has a global footprint in the United States, Ghana, Virgin Islands, Haiti, Jamaica, Panama, and the Baptist World Alliance. Like Zachariah, you waited for the promise, and God gave you Kayla and Candace. After today, this morning, Mr. President, you too, like the lad, you gave all that you had and never asked for anything returned. As a result of this morning, Mr. President, we have reaped 12 baskets of fragments in acquiring a new taste for pizza where we've received over a million dollars. Y'all better stop going to Domino's and, and Pizza Hut. And because of you, we now have partnerships with the endowment program, Blessed Communion. But not strangely, like Paul, you are a scholar, a graduate of Bishop, master's from Payne, and a doctorate from Union University. But you saw Timothy. You were mentored and you soared like an eagle. Before you rose, you waited and you matriculated at the foot of great leaders like E. Edward Jones, your home past R.B. House, John Nash, Victor Washington, and Harry Blake. But I want to tell you all by the end of tonight, you too can celebrate because after he gives his vision and provides us with his message, you too will be like the travelers on the road to Emmaus when we will say, did not our heart burn with fire? Brothers and sisters, delegates of this convention, sinners if there be any, I'm proud to introduce to some and to others God's man covered by his blood, the salt for this season, Greater St. Mary's Shepherd, Louisiana Home and Foreign Mission Baptist Convention's eighth president, current president of North American Baptist Fellowship, vice president of the Board of Supervisors for Southern University, Lake Charles Senior Pastor, Pleasant Hill's favorite son, and the 15th president of the National Baptist Convention of America. Shall we receive Dr. Samuel Claude Talbot? God bless you, Mr. President. about tomorrow I just leave from day to day I don't bother Turn 
to grain I, I don't worry over the future for I know I know what Jesus said I said I don't know about tomorrow sunshine oh for the clouds may turn turn to gray I, I don't worry over the, the future What lies ahead? Oh, many things about about tomorrow. I I don't see.
Tasha. That's good news today. And I if you can. God bless Sister Cynthia Taylor. Dr. Cynthia Taylor. The wife of Dr. Joel Taylor of Chicago, Illinois. We didn't hear from Dr. Taylor this week, but we heard from Jasper and Cynthia. And things are moving right along with the Taylors. To Vice Presidents, Banks, Glenn, Garden, Smith, and Alexander. General Secretary Dixon, the Treasurer Sampson, other executive officers, state presidents, moderators, pastors, officers, members, delegates, and everybody. To our special guests, and one of my mentors, to Dr. Harry Blake of Shreveport, Louisiana. Thank you for coming from Shreveport to be with us after going through your meeting on last week in New Orleans. What an honor. So also tonight we honor Dr. Major Jemison a former president of Progressive National Baptist Convention who preached for us on last night in a mighty way and has returned with us on tonight. To the Reverend David Cabot, the president of the General Baptist Convention of Oklahoma and all Oklahoma pastors, you have done a stellar job in hosting us this week. Let's give them a good hand. Amen. NBCA has not been in Oklahoma since 1962, 57 years ago, but they've operated this week as if we've been here on a regular basis. Thank you. Where's President Cabot? Right here. Thank you so much, Mr. President. To the NBCA officers and staff, I want to thank you for your support of the vision and the strategic plan of NBCA. To my wife of 33 years, the lovely Matilda, who's right here on the front. And you do know a lot of what I do, I have to get it vetted first to make sure I can do it with support. It doesn't matter how great a work you want to do, but if you're going to do it and have to fight when you go home. And I have one of the most supportive wives that any husband could ask for. And so we're working now in a few months for her to retire from that librarian job so she can see if she can keep up with me on the road. And 
And I want to thank God that Candace graduated this year from the Department of Engineering at Lamar with a degree in Industrial Technology. And that Kayla has now graduated with her MBA and law degree. <clears throat> And all of us ought to be proud of our children. I'm not saying mine is better than yours, but I'm proud of mine. And I want to say tonight, since I don't have tuition and rent, praise hallelujah. But I do know they are girls, so, you know, I do understand. Where's Reverend Layless Johnson? He has four, so he know their graduating really don't mean much when it comes to that money stuff. But anyway, at least we went through that. Tonight to one of the greatest churches, and I've decided to stop saying the greatest church because God has a lot of great churches. But to one of the greatest churches, seriously, that a pastor could serve, the Greater St. Mary Missionary Baptist Church in Lake Charles, Louisiana, where I was baptized, where I preached my first sermon in a couple of months, 40 years ago, and where I married my wife, who grew up in that church, her father and mother, and my mother joined church the same Sunday. Her father's name was Samuel. Her brother name is Samuel. His son name is Samuel. My dad name was Samuel. My name is Samuel. And Candace was almost Samantha. But my wife objected. But I love Greater St. Mary. It doesn't matter where I go and what I do. I thank God for a supporting church. I have not been at my church. This is the first time I can remember doing this. I really pulled one this year. I haven't been at St. Mary to preach in three Sundays. I've been absent. Uh, so they came, some of them. Don't y'all stand up again and look at y'all? See if y'all, all right? They came to see me, huh? Well, bring me back home. That's what y'all want. I'm going to preach a long Sunday, too. I want y'all to know. But, but seriously, I thank God for the church. Um, and, and this is to say to a pastor who's at a church looking to go somewhere else. And God may want to move you. But God can do what he wants with you wherever he puts you. And now he may decide to move you somewhere else. But I, I've never campaigned to go somewhere else. I just want to be where the Lord wants me to be. And I love being at Greater St. Mary because they act crazy sometimes, and, and I act crazy, and we don't kiss, and we still make up. <laughs> but I come to tell you tonight that time is filled with swift transition. Yes, sir. Not of earth unmoved shall stand. There are those like the late Dr. Earl Pleasant, Dr. Powers of California, and numerous others who are no longer with us, but they have transitioned to be with the Lord. We miss these workers, but we must continue to work the works of him that sent us. I am humbled by your presence and by your commitment to the great work that God has made possible with us working together. And I want to say tonight that no one person can do all what's happening in NBCA. It may look like it, but there are a whole lot of people behind the scene and on the scenes that are thinking and supporting and praying and making things happen. It's just my turn to be the president. And a lot of people give the leader credit for what other people have done. That's all right, y'all can go and give it to me, but I'm just telling you, there are some other people uh, that's making this happen. I want to thank 
the pastors in Lake Charles, like I try to do whenever I remember. Some of them are here where you stand. I saw them right up in here somewhere. Pastors of Lake Charles. These brothers stand with me. And it, it makes it wonderful to know that even when sometimes the church leadership can't get somewhere, they'll go to the hospital or they'll do a funeral or whatever needs to be done. And you know, some of us want to be something everywhere but at home. But I want to be able to work with these brothers in Lake Charles. I want to thank my pastor tonight uh, who came and gave a wonderful introduction. And it's good to have a smart pastor. And some people want to be their own pastor. And when you're your own pastor, you got a poor pastor. Uh, but I have a smart pastor uh, who has an earned PhD. But he's just as silly as he can be when he wants to be. But thank God for Dr. Kyron Coleman. I want you to know tonight that we've got a lot of talent and God has blessed us with treasures and he's given some time for us to do our work. And we have been working to serve this present age in relevant and meaningful ways. As I move across the country representing NBCA, I'm often confronted by those who have heard pastors, ministers, and delegates, including those who are presently or who are previously affiliated with NBCA, say that conventions like ours have served their purpose and are swiftly moving toward a state of non-existence, ultimately becoming a thing of the past. I think it might surprise you that most of you hear this many times. And I want to say that in many areas of that statement, I have some agreement. Conventions as we know them. But indeed becoming, they are indeed becoming a thing of the past. But with our officers and auxiliary leaders and others, board, chairman, secretary, treasurers, we're striving toward cutting edge ministry in every aspect. We're not gonna die because we're gonna change. And as I said to the pastor's conference or the preacher's conference on yesterday, I think it was, that if a room is hot and you go to the thermostat and lower the temperature on the thermostat, it's gonna take a while for the room to cool off. And what I want you to know that we're changing the thermostat but it's going to take time for you to feel the change in its full force. And so we must continue to work. I'm proud to be a Baptist. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I want to ask us to earth the cross and the minister's wives and widow's auxiliary to do is to help me launch a Baptist proud campaign. Well, we would get some buttons that say Baptist Proud. Now, not the Baptist Pride. I don't like that word because it could do something. <laughs> but Baptist Proud. And pastors, at their discretion, I know we are autonomous, can get those buttons. And our members, we need to start being proud to be Baptists. I'm not against all of the others, but I'm definitely for being a Baptist. And so we will engage continually in our works and missions at home and abroad, responding to disasters, expanding our mission fields as we've done in the Bahamas and in Liberia over the last few weeks. We look forward to retaking the property, the 60 acres in Ghana, West Africa, where the E. Edward Jones School once operated. It has been closed. And the brothers over there uh, took took us and Ghana Baptist to court to prevent us from reoccupying it. And so I said to the president of the Ghana Baptist Convention a few weeks ago, uh, I know we've gotten 
some relief, but how are we going to get it back? And he said, well, the brothers tell me we're going to take it by force. I said, wait, bro. I said, don't take it by force. I'm coming to Ghana soon. I don't want them out looking for me. Uh, but we have some other remedies. Talks have developed that are releasing some of the pressure that Dr. Banks and I went through in negotiations in Ghana on last year, and they hope to have possession of the property again by the end of September. 60 acres. And then they will open a primary school. They're going to do a, a nursing training college on that campus. Now, I've met the pastor who's going to plant a church on that campus. And they're going to look at agriculture, ways to grow on that property, and it will become a Baptist compound of redevelopment in Ghana, West Africa. And it will be renamed, I guess this is a recommendation, the Dr. E. Edward Jones and Leslie Jones campus. Amen? Since we're going to have more than a school, we're going to just call it a campus. And I know our secretaries are writing all this good stuff down. If one not writing it, the other one. And somebody record me because I'm looking at myself on this thing right here. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Forbes magazine reported that Popeyes reaped $65 million in equivalent media value as a result of the online chicken sandwich war. $65 million is the price a company would have to pay to purchase the media attention that Popeyes received for free, mostly from African Americans. In addition to the media value, the chicken giant generated $23 million in its first few days on sale. What is my point? I'm glad you asked. Collectively, we as a people, we have the power to change the way the world sees us. The ability to change the perception, the relevance, and the effectiveness of denominational bodies such as district associations, state convention, national convention, and NBCA lies within our hands to make a difference in this world. There was traffic congestion that occurred on major streets and highways, pandemonium set in as folks walked in drive through fist fights ensued inside of restaurants across the country, and at least two instances, lawsuits were filed out of a frustration by those who couldn't get their hands on an unhealthy chicken sandwich. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, if social media can move masses to wait in long lines and go through those types of changes and circumstances to pay for something that is not the greatest meal for their health, then surely we as Christians ought to be able to use our resources to move the world and the church into a direction that gives glory to God. They can discover and pursue their God-given purpose in the world. People can do this if we would help them. We have work to do, NBCA, and the future of the church is in our hands. No one church is a convention. That needs to be said. No one church is a convention. Conventions are made up of pastors and churches. And in our case, they are made up of pastors and churches around the country, not one church in one location. Just this week, while riding here in Oklahoma City, touring churches in the area, I went by St. John, a great church uh, where Dr. Major Jemison serves as the pastor. I became aware of an article disclosing that Pepsi Cola admitted publicly that their highly coveted Aquafina water is nothing more than tap water. <laughs> After years and years of false advertisement, the truth finally came out. I don't know about you, but I want my money back. On a serious note, 
I was instantly reminded of our dear sister Taylor's testimony here on Tuesday morning about visiting other conferences and denominational meetings who displayed different packaging only to find that what she was looking for and needed was right here in NBCA. The one, as I've said it before, who does not advertise is like the person who blinks in the dark. Nobody knows it but you. And so we're going to have to better package and market what we are doing in NBCA so that we become more effective at attracting people, millennials and others, to have a role of leadership and participation in NBCA. I am proud of what we have been able to do, but I'm also aware that I need your help in spreading the word about our efforts. Tonight, if I get up and move over a few steps and slap Reverend Banks, I know it's going to be a fight, but it's going to be all over the country. And I plan for our sit down tonight to talk about Jesus. And we've got to learn how to get that word out. Stop putting the bad message out and put the great gospel message and what we're doing to the glory of God. In order to further assist our mission and our service to the congregation and communities across this country, I will make tonight at some point, and it'll take a little time, that I only get one time a year, 10 recommendations that cover some various areas that need to be addressed. My brothers and sisters, this is my message. I'll preach in a minute. Please stand as we sing the hymn of the church, Amazing Grace.
if you'll stand with me, our text tonight is in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to only read verses 1 and 2. And verses 3 through 10 will be homework. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. The grass withered, the flower thereof faded away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You may be seated. I want to talk tonight about the Zacchaeus story. The Zacchaeus story. This sermon was inspired as my wife and I sat in a lecture at the 2019 Baptist World Alliance annual meeting a few months ago in Nassau, Bahamas. The lecture was presented by a brother from Jamaica, the Reverend Devon Dick, who is the pastor of the Boulevard Baptist Church in St. Andrew, Jamaica. On July the 10th, 2019, at the Malia Hotel, this lecturer's title was a challenge for me as a Christian as I heard the title at the beginning of the lecture. And I will read for you and I quote the initial excerpts from his lecture. The title, he says, of this paper derives from a comment made in 1835 by James Byrd, or James Beard, a Methodist class leader and apprentice to Henry Laidlaw, a special magistrate. James Beard was enslaved, but he and the other persons who were enslaved were told that of, as of August 1st, 1834, they were to be set free according to the first clause of an act of emancipation in 1833, but the second clause said that they needed to serve a period of four to six years of apprenticeship, listen at this, to prepare for freedom. <laughs> On August 4th, 1835, Beard, this enslaved man, inquired of Laidlaw, who was visiting the Balg Estate in Portland, Jamaica. And this was his question. Were the Israelites made apprentices when they came out of Egypt? Laidlaw said no. Then Beard asked the magistrate to swear on the Bible that God had made him and others apprentices. Late law did so crookedly, put his hand on the Bible, and he swore that God made them apprentices. And when Beard heard that, he said, God has done us a great injustice. And that was the subject of Reverend Devon Dick's lecture that day, God has done us a great injustice. Well, you know, I had trouble. But you know you got to learn to listen to the end. And it made a whole lot of sense when he got through. God has done us a great injustice, he said. Well, when we look at this passage in Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus has done a whole lot of people. Some great injustices. In the Zacchaeus story, I want to demonstrate how 
a transformed sinner brings up himself, giving from his wealth and paying reparations. Because there were two types of giving that Zacchaeus spoke about. He first talked about giving to the poor. And then he talked about giving back to those that he had to throw. And so that last one was really reparations. Reparations is in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. When they got ready to leave Egypt, they were told to take some things with them. Do not leave empty-handed. Take you some things with you. You've been working all of these years enslaved. Certainly you deserve to have some reparations. Slavery has been in this country since August 20th, 1619. And I know some folk don't like to talk about it, but it's time for some reparations. And so here, my brothers and sisters, you do not, you need to know that every saint has been a sinner. One cannot bypass your sinnerhood and arrive at your sainthood. This is Luke's account of the encounter that Zacchaeus had with Jesus in Jericho that turned into salvation for Zacchaeus and financial liberation for a couple of groups. The context of this passage put us at the end of Luke chapter number 18, which is a report of a blind man. The blind man is also in the vicinity of Jericho. The blind man in Luke 18 is physically blind. But the blind man in Luke 19 is spiritually blind. And so let's look tonight at the story of Zacchaeus. The first thing we discover in the first two verses of the text is the transgressions of Zacchaeus. Jesus entered into Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Jericho, you see, is only about 10 miles from Jerusalem. Crowds had already started following Jesus since the healing of the blind man in Luke chapter 18. In Jericho, there was a great collection of priests that resided in Jericho. Yet Jesus is passing through Jericho. A great collection of priests in Jericho. But Jesus is passing through Jericho with no stops or no meetings with the priests. He is passing through. We are informed that before he leaves town, he does stop for a sinner. He didn't stop for the college of priests, but he stopped for a sinner. He's always stopping for sinners. He stopped with the woman at the well in Samaria and offered her a drink of everlasting water. He stopped and talked to Nicodemus, who needed to be born again. He stopped for the 10 lepers, but only one returned to say thank you. He stopped for the nobleman who had a son that was sick. And he never went to the son's bedside, but he spoke from where he was. Your son will live. He stopped for a man that had been hanging out at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. 
and used as an excuse every time I try to get in. When the angels trouble the water, somebody get in before me. It would appear to me if you've been there 38 years, you should have got to the edge of the pool and roll yourself over in. But he put the blame. There was no man to put me in when the angel troubled the water. But Jesus stopped by the pool, told the man, rise, take up your bed and walk. For 38 years, your bed had, you have been on your bed. But today, your bed's going to be on you. He stopped here in Luke 19 for a tough tax collector. Yet no meeting with the cast of priests that resided in Jericho. One day, he stopped for a sinner named Sam Talbot. Being raised in a poor neighborhood by a single mother named Magnolia. I'm glad he stopped for me. If he stopped for you, you ought to be glad about it. You see, Jericho was this, this place of regional commerce. The primary product of trade there was bone. The balm, which came especially from the Gilead district, was sent there into all parts of the world. And since the exchange of product and money was extensive in Jericho, a tax office had been set up in Jericho. Zacchaeus had been assigned the head of the customs department got a good job and it messed him up. There are a lot of folk who be better off poor. If they get a little substance, they get messed up. He got good and crooked at the receipt of taxes. That kills at the head of the customs department. He was there overcharging the taxpayer. He was despised by the residents of Jericho because of his corrupted tax collecting practices. Zacchaeus was such a sinner that his lifestyle was, of course, rejected by God. But his lifestyle was also rejected by men. Many times the displeasure of God with human conduct does not translate into man's displeasure with human conduct. In other words, there are people who are sinning and God is not pleased, but their family has no problem. Their friends have no problems. Their associates have no problem with their conduct. But Zacchaeus had a double problem. His sin got him in trouble with God, and he got in trouble with men. He was in a tight position. This sinner was outside of God's will with his extortion of the citizenry of Jericho. You see, he had his hands on the scale and was gravely overcharging the residents in taxation. You cannot do wrong to man and please God. Zacchaeus was in a tight position. The opposition for him had heightened. My brothers and sisters, economic harm had been inflicted upon the people of Jericho by Zacchaeus. Financial damage is the result of his overcharging for taxes. He had the authority to charge for taxes, but he did not have holy permission to overcharge for taxes. He was restricting the spending power of the taxpaying Jericho residents. Not only was he restricting their spending power, 
but he was restricting the spending power of their heirs. That sounds like slavery in America. They restricted the spending power of the slaves, which also has restricted the spending power of the descendants of the slaves. This man was a sinner. He had become wealthy in his position of this frauding the citizens of undue taxes. He was wealthy materially. But the text gives us some strong hints that he was spiritually bankrupt. His transgressions were off the chain. And so in the story of Zacchaeus, we see the transgressions of Zacchaeus. But in verses 3 through 4, we see the thirst of Zacchaeus. He sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him far he was to pass that way. The parade route must have already been published and the buzz at the tax collecting office was Jesus was in town. And here is a copy of the parade route. And he was passing on a certain route. And Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. Here is a demonstration of a different interest of Zacchaeus. He abandons his tax office to get to see Jesus. Jesus becomes a priority for a sinner. And if Jesus can become a priority for a lost sinner, he ought to be a priority for saved saints. He becomes a priority for this lost sinner. This sinner has developed a thirst for Jesus. Out of all Zacchaeus has done, he yet seeks an encounter with Jesus. And we need to tell the world it doesn't matter what you've done. You can still have an audience with Jesus. His courage and bravery must be commended. Yes, he was not a coward. He was not a coward as a tax collector. And he's not a coward when he decided, I want to see Jesus. This man climbed into a sycamore tree. He did not worry about what the people were going to say. He wanted to see Jesus. When I was in Ghana, West Africa, a couple of weeks ago, I visited with some people from the Asante tribe. It's a large historic tribe of people in Ghana. They had a practice of gathering men for the military. And if a man refused to enlist in the military, it is said that they would catch him and take a knife and strike it across his forehead. They wouldn't kill him. They'd let him live. But he'd have to live with that scar. And that scar was a reminder of he is a coward. If he saw a woman that he liked, when he walked up to her, she would know he had the scar of a coward. If he went on a job interview, and the job required bravery. He flunked the interview. Not with his oracle, oracle skills, but he would flunk it because he had a scar of cowardness. I think I need to throw it in. We got a lot of folk with concealed scar of bravery, of cowardness rather, in the church. When it comes to witnessing, we are cowards. We want to be secret disciples. 
We want to be Sunday disciples. But God doesn't need no coward soldiers. God needs some brave soldiers. And so Zacchaeus at least does not show us a scar of cowardice. He manned up to the fact that I'm in a tight position. Tight position with God and a tight position with man. I'm a sinner in God's sight and I'm a sinner in the residence site. I've got to get out of this tight spot. And so therefore, there was a thirst created in him. He wanted to see Jesus. A thirst for Jesus had arisen in his spirit. No doubt he was tired of his current predicament. The crowd and his shortness of stature had become a hindrance between his thirst for Jesus and his ability to actually secure an audience with the master. Zacchaeus possessed more than the curiosity of a crowd. There was an inward desire of him to meet Jesus. He was not there to engage in spectating. Therefore, he ran ahead of the crowd. Sometimes when you are doing the work of Jesus, you've got to run ahead of the crowd. Some of us like hanging out with folk with no vision. Hanging out with people who got little thinking. You know, I've heard so much in my ministry, you can't do that. Until I've gotten to the point when they tell me, I prove to them God's going to do it. And, and, and you need to have folk around you who believe God can do it. I'm thinking about that retreat center now. Some folk told me, that's the wrong city. Why would we go to Louisville with a little college with less than 500 students? Why would we put our headquarters there? Well, God wanted it there. I didn't know that John Snyder lived in Louisville and that he would walk in a Simmons College building and see my picture on the wall and ask Dr. Cosby what that's about. And he said, that's our national president. We're in partnership. He said, I want to meet that guy. And he got on his private jet in Utah later and flew down to Lake Charles and I thought he'd have an entourage of people with him just the two pilots he got off the plane and say what we riding in and I drove him to the church I want to tell you this story because they said there's a meeting room at the private jet place and y'all have access to that meeting room I said I like meetings at church and I took him to the church and talked to him a little while and then brought him in the sanctuary. He looked up. He said, what's going on up there? I said, we got some repair work that need to be done. When he got through, he said, don't worry about it. I'm going to bring my men in. We're going to fix all of that. I'm coming to tell you you ought to have more meetings at the church. We meeting too much in restaurants and hotels and casino you know that say casino the word sin is in there y'all see brother preachers if we're trying to do God's work we need to learn that the church is a good place to bring your potential people who are looking for Jesus and so Zacchaeus possessed more than a curiosity uh, of a crowd. He really wanted to see Jesus. He climbed his little short self up into a sycamore tree, a tree that bore the fruit that usually poor people would eat. Here is Reverend Alexander, a rich man, climbing a poor man's tree 
God can flip the script. He climbs into a sycamore tree. Even though it was a poor man's tree, a wealthy man decides, I want to see Jesus. It does not matter to me what they're going to say about me being in that tree. He humbled himself as a man of wealth at the expense of being accused of attaching his little wealthy self to a meager sycamore tree. Because in the story of Zacchaeus, he had a thirst to see Jesus. But then in verses 5 through 7, there is the tie-in of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus got tied in to Jesus. It is a tree, you note, that provides the tie-in. I ought to stop and just let you shout. It is a tree, you know, that gave us our tie-in. It wasn't a tree in Jericho, but it was a tree on the hill called Calvary. Sinners can plunge beneath that flood and lose all their guilt and sin. I'm trying to get through here now. And so there he climbed the tree. And Jesus saw Zacchaeus where he was and he knew he needed a life-changing event. Zacchaeus had to work to reduce his hindrances from the throb of the multitudes. He had to work even after he got into the tree because these sycamore trees had wide green leaves. He had to work to reduce his hindrances from the throb of the mob. And then he had to work to reduce the hindrances of the wide spanded green leaves of a sycamore tree. And what's interesting in the text, he wanted to see Jesus. If you just want to see him, he will see you. Jesus saw him who wanted to see Jesus. And I heard Jesus say to him, come down, come down, for today I must go with you to your house. Jesus didn't go to his tax collecting office, but I want to go to your house. When somebody get a crazy mind on their job, they probably got messed up at home. And Jesus doesn't deal with symptoms. He deals with root causes. I don't want to go to the tax collected office. I don't want to go to any of your satellite offices. But I want to go to your house. Because home is where the breakdown takes place. Repair must be consummated at the point of the breakdown. Home is where the breakdown takes place. If we could focus our churches, and I'm working on it now, brothers, to focus our churches on a home and not just individuals. Don't lose the individual touch, but focus on the home. Because when you win one out of the home and send them back to a lost house, you got a woman with a lost husband cussing and drugging children. She's got a hard time as a new Christian being able to handle the pressure of the environment and the culture of the home. And what we could do if you get one out of house, if we focus on the home, Jesus said, today 
I must go to your house. Yeah, I want you to know that your home is the space and the environment for character development. The Savior's request is uh, come down quickly. It is an emergency. I need to get to your house today. Stop waiting until tomorrow. Today is the time. Come down and welcome Jesus gladly. Yeah, they complain that Jesus is associating with sinners. But I want to thank God that Jesus visits Trump. He may ignore him, but he still visits him. He hangs out with sinners. And so I'm going in my seat. That is the time of Zacchaeus. That tree becomes the intersection between a sinner and a saint. Somebody ought to remember your intersection where you were a sinner and God changed you to his saint. In the final verses 8 through 10, there is the transformation of Zacchaeus. Tell the story, Tauber. Yeah, he is, a, a, he is a, a man with a testimony. Yes, and I heard Zacchaeus. After he met Jesus, he thought about his job. And I heard him say, I will give half my wealth to the poor. And let me tell you, the wealthy ought to give to the poor. But that's not reparation. That's being a blessing because you've been blessed. You ought to give from your abundance. But Zacchaeus had a twofold giving heart. I heard him say next to Jesus, I will restore fourfold. Here reparations coming. Any money to any person that I have cheated. I heard Kevin Cosby say that if you steal my car on a Monday and you get saved on Tuesday and you still driving my car on Wednesday, you need to check your salvation. There are some folks in the United States that stole our car in 1619. And for the last 400 years, they've been saying they are saved. I want to tell them when you get saved, you ought to pay back what you took from us. Reparations is not just something I want. It's something I'm old. But I want to thank God that that day salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. I want to know tonight, has salvation come to your house? Somebody say, I'm saved and sanctified. But what we need is salvation uh, to come to our house. Uh, and the only way you're going to get salvation uh, at your house, uh, you're going to need Jesus uh, to visit your house. Uh, I'm glad uh, that one day Jesus, uh, oh, Jesus uh, visited my house. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, he picked me up uh, and turned me around. Uh, he saved me uh, from a burning hell. Uh, and I want to tell him, uh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, oh, thank you, 
Jesus. You didn't have to do it. And, but you did. I'm going to my seat now. But I want to thank Jesus for going to the hill. Call Calvary and going to that tree and dying. Dying one Friday. He died. Do you know he died? But I want to thank God. Thank God that early, early Sunday morning he rose, he rose with all power, with all power in his hand. Tell him thank you, tell him thank you, thank you. Tell him thank you. gospel has been preached in this place. Let me try it one more time. The gospel has been preached. Let me try it just one more time. The gospel has been preached in this place on tonight. Let's just give God praise for what he has done tonight in the life of our president, Dr. Samuel Tall. But there might be somebody here tonight who's suffering from a Zacchaeus condition. But the good news of the text is housed in the fact that the same God who was able to do it in the life of Zacchaeus, he's able to do it in the lives of people even today. And if you're here without Christ, if you don't know him in the pardoning of your sins, you're not connected to a body of believers. You don't have to leave out of here in the same condition that you came in. I bless God for the fact that the tree connects us. I praise God for giving our president the spiritual insight to help us to recognize that he told Zacchaeus to come down from the tree, but later Jesus refused to come down. He paid the ultimate price for our sins. And if you're here tonight without Christ, without a church home, if you're not connected to a body of believers, it's, it's your opportunity. If you're here tonight and you know that there is doubt in your mind as it pertains to where you will spend eternity, the good news is if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart. You don't have to fill out any applications. You don't have to pass any exams. If you will acknowledge that he did die, he was buried. But we praise God that the grave is now empty. And we can shout tonight. We can rejoice tonight about the promises of God. We can rejoice even about the empty promises of God. Some may be wondering how can we rejoice about empty promises. Well, first of all, he promised an empty manger, and he kept that promise because Jesus is no longer a baby. Then later he promised an empty cross. He kept that promise because he's no longer hanging 
at a hill called Calvary. Then thirdly, he promised an empty grave because the grave is empty. He got up with all power, and yet there is one empty promise to be fulfilled, and that is an empty chair because he's now seated at the right hand of the Father making intercessions. But one of these days, he's going to get up from that chair, reach back into heaven's wardrobe, pull out a rainbow, drape it around his shoulder, plant one foot on nothing and the other foot on nowhere. Somebody's going to look up and say, yonder comes Jesus. And when he comes, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It's ours to extend, yours to accept or to reject. God bless you. Let's give God praise for our leader. Tonight, some of these recommendations, which I know are necessary, these, some of them, will be my hand on the thermostat. We won't fulfill the full impact tonight. But we've got to get ready for transition. I'm not going to always be president. And there are others in leadership. We're not going to be here. we got to get the convention ready. You don't want to build all this up. And then have it set up for failure. And so some of these recommendations will help us with some of that. 